my case, my experience, minors counsel didn't talk to the parents. Um, and that seems strange to me. Why, if they are supposed to have the child's best interest, why wouldn't they talk to both parents in, in a case? host is Aaron Carranza. Aaron, are you there? I'm here. Um, I got a message. You wanted to ask me a couple questions. I do. I was wondering about minors counsel. So um, in my case, in my experience, minors counsel didn't talk to the parents. Um, and that seems strange to me. Why, if they are supposed to have the child's best interest, why wouldn't they talk to both parents in in a case? Well, you know, primarily because speak to them? primarily because the attorney um, there's something you know attorneys can't talk to parties that are represented by other attorneys. So in your case, you have a court appointed attorney, and there's a minors counsel. Mm -hmm. um, that minors counsel just can't call you up without the permission from your attorney. It's unethical. Right. The the minors counsel could get in a lot of trouble. I, you know, as a parent's attorney, probably wouldn't let my client talk to the minors counsel. And there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, um, mm -hmm. you might say something that is inappropriate. You might say something that I was trying to keep confidential. You might say, right. you know, you might say something a certain way and give a bad impression to the minors council. Remember, minors council, they're people, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, they have the same like, you know, likes, dislikes, prejudices, you know, whatever, as just an ordinary person. Okay? They're not different, right? They put their mm -hmm. pants on, you know, one leg at a time. So... And a lot of times, I wouldn't want my client to talk to a minor's counsel. So, okay. it, so I, they're only getting communication between the attorneys and CFS. Right. Correct. What is right. what the not minor's counsel gets. Right. You know, many, many years ago, a couple decades ago or more, I was a court-appointed attorney in Los Angeles County. And back then in the old days, um, if you were a court-appointed attorney, you would represent parents, you would represent relatives, you would represent minors. Now everything is separated where, you know, minors counsel only represent minors. You know, parents counsel only represent parents. And, you know, like I said earlier on another call, um, I don't think they appoint relatives uh, attorneys anymore. So, um, you know, back then, in my opinion, you know, you got a full flavor of representing all sides. Some cases you got to see it from the mother's point of view. Some cases you got to see it from the father's point of view. Some cases you got to see it from the grandma's point of view. And then some cases you got to see it from the minor's point of view, right? Mm -hmm. Now, most attorneys, um, and there might be a few, you know, uh, old timers left over, but you know, the minors attorneys that they have now only have represented minors. You know, they don't look at the case from different points of view. And it might not seem like it, but it's better for them to, for everyone to stay in their own lanes, per se. Well, you know, some people hold that theory. You know, that you stay in your own lane, you, you're an expert at representing minors, you shouldn't be representing parents or vice versa. I personally don't agree with that because that's not the system I grew up with, right? Mm -hmm. That's just the system that they have now. But, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, a lot of cases, um, minors attorneys, you know, for whatever reason, don't, don't talk to me, <laughs> you know? And now, do minors attorneys have special privileges? Can they just 
use whatever paperwork they want? Can they just talk to anybody they want? Do they have to have consent for anything? Or is it just like open doors for them because they're representing a child? Well, it's a little of all of the above. You know, most minors uh, attorneys have investigators of their own, you know, social workers mm -hmm. or assistants who do all of that information, uh, get information gathering and then give it to the minor's attorney and the minor uh, minor's attorney goes to court, you know, and, and does, you know, what they do. Um, sometimes that's for you. Sometimes it's against you. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's just neutral. Um, you know, being a minor's attorney, I, I, I want to tell you this, you know, um, it's hard. It's really hard. You have a lot of responsibility. You know, a lot of people tell me, you know, well, uh, the minor's attorney, all they do is take the side of CPS, right? And, uh, and I have to be honest, it seems like that sometimes, you know, is that the easier way or do they, is that independent thought? You don't know. You don't know. So I don't... I try not to get into it with, you know, too many minors counsel. I have colleagues, you know, other attorneys who they they make it a point to talk to the minors counsel, you know, to figure out what the mm -hmm. minors counsel wants to see or wants to do. And in some cases I do that too. But, you know, every case is different. Every attorney is different. You know, their style, their, you know, the checklist they go through in, in their head. I, I assume on a lot of cases that minors counsel isn't going to go with me. They're going to go with the social worker. But sometimes I'm wrong. I'm dead wrong. And they surprise me. Well, Mr. Davis, right. I wanted to tell you that, you know, I, I think the kids should go back home. Like, what? Okay, great. Right. You know, so, you know, uh, being a minor's attorney um, is, is a difficult situation and it's a difficult position to be put in because there's also people are concerned about things that, that might happen to the child, you know, liability mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So a lot of minor's right. counsel, it seems to me, take the position uh, most conservative position there is. Um, I have a case well, coming. You also have a little life. Right. You have I, a little person depending on you, you know? Right, right. And, and that's a serious thing, right? So I have right. a case coming up where the social worker and the county, I won't mention the county, but they want to dismiss the case. They just want to drop it. <laughs> and I found out that the minors council doesn't want to drop the case. They think there's a serious mm -hmm. problem. Right. So right. you just don't know because everybody has everybody has their own agenda. Let's be real. Let's be honest. Social worker has their own agenda. Parents attorneys have their own agenda. Minors counsel has their own agenda. You know, right. and, so if something like that happens, what would what would cause the 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 caseworkers to three minutes, but not minor counsel, because that seems like a pretty big deal if the child's attorney is like, whoa, 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 no, let's, let's step back a second. Right. Well, the judge has Just to consider general, it. Like, the judge has to consider it. You know, if, if, a, um, if the social worker says, I want to drop the case um, prior to the jurisdiction and dispositional hearing, the only person that can object to it is the minor's counsel. The other parent can't object to it. The non-offending parent can't object to it. So, and, and if the minor's counsel objects to it, then they have the burden of proving the case. Objecting is one thing, but proving there was child abuse and that the child should not be returned to the parent, that's a whole other story. And if right. the social worker says, I want to drop the case because I don't have the evidence, how is the minor's counsel going to prove the case unless they've done some type of independent investigation and have some type of independent witnesses to bring forward? It's going to be so virtually my, impossible. More power. I'm sorry? Per se. So, so it seems like minor's counsel has a little bit more power in the fact that if CPS wants to drop a case and minor's counsel says no, that CPS just can't drop a case when they're finished with it or, you know, it's not serving their purpose. Right. So minors counsel does have a little bit more power in that instance, right? But it, mm -hmm. in the particular case that I'm thinking about and talking about, I'm I'm not concerned because I was also informed that the even though minors counsel is going to object, that they don't have any independent evidence. 
So if the social worker doesn't have any independent evidence and they want to drop the case, and minors counsel doesn't have any additional evidence or witnesses, case should be dropped. Right. Right. And then once you're dropped out of the dependency court, you can move in. One minute. Court Correct. And then start the process all over. Well, it's a different process because there's a different sets of laws. Family court is governed by the family code in California. And in California, juvenile cases, CPS cases are governed by the welfare and institutions code. Different laws. It's not all the same. Right? right. Even even the parties are different. And, you know, usually in a family law case, it's heads up mother against father. In a CPS case, it's mother, father, Mother, father, minors, and social workers. Hey, we got to take a break right now. We'll be back with more questions, stories after these messages.